<laughs> there we go. So thank you, um, welcome. Tonight we present the work of River Hooks beekeeper and resident Nat Wasserstein. The evening will feature a video of a workshop taken at River Hooks new apiary with um, Nat available after the screening to answer your questions. We will learn about the importance of bees to our ecosystem. We'll see inside a bee colony thanks to the transparent walls of Nat's observation hive and we'll witness as Riverhook becomes a significant stop on the pollinator pathway. Experience Riverhook is a year round educational series that showcases the 12 acre Hester Herring case and preserve. Programs will celebrate the arts, environment, education and innovation. During the time of heightened public safety, workshops had been limited to a small audience and recorded by Flying Films New York for broadcast. Video production of this series has been made possible through a gift from the Wells Remy Crowther Charitable Trust. Our next Experience Riverhook program will be in October and is sponsored by PatsosLaw.com and will feature the worm guy, David Goldberg, who introduces some local scouts to the messy magic of worms and soil reclamation. And I believe that Chris Patsos is on the call and wave, can you wave Chris? Thank I'm you. Here. Thank <laughs> you for supporting the nature programs at Riverhook. My pleasure. After the video, which is 21 minutes in length, that will be available for Q&A. We'll also hear from friends of Riverhook, uh, President Paul J. Curley and board member and president of the Wells Remy Crowther Charitable Trust, Allison Crowther. So um, I'll tell you a little bit more about Nat after the film, but we are gonna go ahead and enjoy the second installment of Experience Riverhook. So bear with me while I share my screen. Here we go. I've got a favor to ask you, if you'll help me put this tarp over this observation hive, and then I'll, after we put it up, I'll tell you how this thing works, okay? So, I put a, I put a rope up here, it's a triangle, so I need, I need at least one person here, one person here holding the pole that this will get, each one will get connected to, and then I'll need some people on the bottom of the pole to, not, to put stakes in so that it stays up straight. Okay. So, I'm just going to get a little more slack so mm -hmm. it gets to So right now they're putting up this shield. Yeah, so it's the first thing we're doing. Oh yeah. I just can't go out to the wide because I'm not going to see them. Alright, tighten it up. Alright, what has it looked through there? It's not that, are you trying to like make it to the, I mean, what do you want the shadow? I want, I want a lot of it over the hive. I want to need a lot of it. I think about, you know, probably. What's in here, the bees are not supposed to get in here. And, and I'll tell you, I'll show you why. There's a hole here that I blocked up because there's no bees. Something's going to make a house out of it. And there's another hole on this side. But the main entrance is the chimney facing away. So if we were here and there were bees, as long as we're like moving slowly, they're just going to be zipping in and out of the top. They're not going to care what we're doing down here. So when when the bees are young, and they're just building up their population, 
they're going to be mostly interested in building comb and the queen is going to be laying eggs and they're going to be tending you know the babies the larva and the, the, it goes into its cocoon and it gets capped so while that's happening i'll have sugar water in here typical honey frame uh honey hive um she's we have uh this has been around since the 1800s this 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 type of hive it's called a langrove hive and what on these frames you'll you'll see brood typically in the middle and then some a rainbow of pollen and then oh and then another rainbow of honey and the reason why you see that anybody have like anybody ever have those um drawbreak draw breakers yeah. Right? You know when you're going through the levels? <laughs> if you took that and you were able to cut it in half, which you can't, but if you could, <laughs> you would see all those levels. So if you cut it in half, and then you take one of those halves, and you cut it again in quarter, and you take a slice, that's what this is. So the, so the bees are in a cluster, like a big grapefruit. And in the middle is the queen. And then you got brood, and when you when I do the first inspection, you're going to see a brood a brood frame. It's all going to be capped brood, and you're just going to see bees everywhere. And those are nurse bees. They're very young. Their whole job is to feed and clean um, the baby and to keep them warm. That's why they're all over the place. So. Now, there are a couple kinds of bees. Um, obviously, there's a queen, there are workers, and there's a drum. Right? The interesting thing to note is that they all start off as an egg for three days, and they all start off, and then they move to a larva for another six days. And that's what they have in common. But then, yeah. I was gonna ask, how do they figure out who's a worker and Great right question. So in the first couple of days, um, I think it's three days. So it's within that nine-day period. Yeah. That's when the cast. Because you're asking me, like, what they do, right? I'm, I'm sorry, you're asking me about the, <laughs> the, the sex of the. Like, how do they select? Yeah, how do right. they select? That's when they decide. That's when it's decided whether or not the bee will be just a worker or a queen. I'll get into queens either later or another time because it's a whole subject. Now, drones, though, it's important to understand that um, there are these are cells. So, assume, <laughs> pretend that they're covered with um, wax. Um, in fact, I'm going to show you. It's easier for me to illustrate. Really a frame of honey that I took out at the end of a winter. It's got a little bit of nectar in it. You see how it's shiny? Mm -hmm. um, so these are cells. And this is wax. Obviously this is honey. Um, you see the different colors? That's the different colored pollen. It represents different plants at different times of the year. Um, so these are all worker cells. If they were drone cells, they would look like little bullets. And if they were a queen cell, they would typically be hanging down here or right on right on the, uh, the surface of the frame. And that looks like a cup. It, it, and it, it looks like a peanut. In fact, it might, it really looks like those marshmallow peanuts. You know, that you know what I'm talking about? That's what they look like. And, and what determines a queen is how long the nurse bees feed the baby larva royal gel. So you're in a centrifuge, spin it, and all the honey goes up it's a wall, and you collect it that way. Or you do it the old way, you scrape everything off into like a net, like a, what's that called? Cheese cloth. 
uh, what's the net Colander. Cheese, colander. Cheese cloth. Cheese cloth. Yeah. Right, that's it. <laughs> and you just squeeze it. Yeah. So that's honey. Um, different pollen makes different honey, different tastes. Honey sometimes clear, sometimes it's sometimes it's black. I haven't had black yet, mm. but I I have had really dark brown. Where you kind of like looking at it, thinking, I don't know if it's good. Does honey age? Does it get darker as it ages? No, but it can spoil. Okay. It can ferment. So you'll really? at, this doesn't smell. This just smells like honey. Yeah. Does it smell like honey? <laughs> it crystallized, doesn't it? Well, that that's what happens with raw honey. Oh, okay. So after well, most raw honey, if it's what? clear, eventually it's going to get cloudy, and eventually it's going to get to like peanut butter, which I think is give it because it doesn't drip all over the place. Ooh. You just take a knife and you put it on toast. Question. I heard honey never goes bad in the yeah, last like forever. Ah, uh, gotcha, gotcha. Does that? So is that a lie? Or is that... It's not a lie. They found honey in yeah, Egyptian tombs. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was, I mean, it wasn't liquid, but it was still, it was still honey. It so good. What are the conditions that make Stung by a bee? You get stung by a forager or a guard, which is kind of a forager. The last job that they have in life is foraging. So those are the older bees. So when they come out of the, when they come out of their cell, First thing they do is clean up their own cell. Then they get to work in the nursery, making sure the little babies are fed and clean and everything else. And then after a while, they get another job. They just start building comb. They become comb builders. And then some become undertakers, where you gotta take out dead bees. Um, some become guards. How do you know? Guards are usually at the entrance. Um, and you can tell it's a guard because one, it's not flying in and out. Two, when you move your hand, it follows you. You know, it's, it's watching you. Um, and three, it's got a, a defensive posture, which is it, its front its front legs, I guess, are up hot. It's holding that, it's sort of propping up its body like this, almost like a guard dog. So when, when you see that, you know, you got to be careful. And that's what the smoke is for. The smoke is actually for the guards because there's an alarm chemical that goes off. And once everybody smells that alarm chemical, it's hard to control. Um, the smoke makes it hard for that chemical to, to, to dissipate. Yes, yeah, this is sugar water. It's one to one. So yeah, see they're humming, they're buzzing at a different pitch, which means they're a little worried. Are they reacting to the newness of this hive? Does that have something to do with it? No. They just don't like the idea that somebody's messing around. Oh, sorry, 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 sorry.
So I'm going to start with taking out one of these. This has white wax in it, which means wow. they just made it. You guys see that? Yeah. So, so this is new wax, new comb. And there's, you can see the nectar in it. It's shiny. How many bees would you say are in that hive right now? 200. Um, Maybe a few thousand? About 5,000. 5,000. Okay, so here we see brood. We see drone brood. So you see the bullets. And then we see worker brood. This pollen, it all looks okay. This is an experiment. This is not comb. This is artificial comb. I try, it's something that, it's wax, but it's, it, it, all right. Okay, just, just, what? Okay, just back up. No, I mean, if you just back up for a little while, it'll, Okay, they look fine. All right, all right, all right, all right, all right. You okay? Yeah, I'm good. Yeah, I'm good. Honey and this comb. And apparently they don't like the comb, so that instead of using it, they're getting rid of it. So there's a lot of, there's, well, there's dead bees down there, but that's okay. But there's um, pieces of wax from this. That's what's going on over there. That's pretty good. So right here, see this is a mite, but you can't really see it. That's that's most likely a mite, a varroa mite. Mite. This is what's killing most of the bees across the country. Oh, really? So, wow. So there's a there's a candy uh, stopper here. Mm -hmm. um, so the way you're supposed to release them is you take out the cork and then you put it back in, and the hive will chew through the candy mm -hmm. and let her out. So the queen's su su substantially bigger. Can you tell which? 
bigger abdomen. Okay. It's right there. Yeah. Um, wow. And this this is a virgin queen, so she's she's gonna have to leave that hive to mm -hmm. mate and come back hopefully. Mm -hmm. But um. Does it look healthy? Yeah, she looks good. I mean, I'm gonna try to. I might as well try to mark her. Yeah. Where do you want to put oh, on? And I'm hoping I don't get stung. Let me get ready. And I'll give you my. That's it. Looks okay. And in 16 days, there'll be a new queen. So it's okay. No, these guys are acting kind of weird too. Maybe it was. Shake rat it, just gonna like kill her. There's too many bees in there. Yeah, they're coming out. They're coming out. You got one or two left in there. Okay, she's down. I don't see her up here. You didn't see the white go in, right? I didn't know. Yeah. But she's in there. If she wasn't, they wouldn't be there. Well done. Can um can folks hear me? Very good. Yeah. So that that was absolutely wonderful. Uh, the camera work is by Vinnie Garrison of uh, Flying Film New York, and now I have I'm going to introduce the co-star of the Apiary at Riverhook because of course right Nat I think I'm right the Queen is the real star the Queen gets the top bill. That is true. 
but here's the the the, the uh, co-star um uh, of of the uh apiary at riverhook is nat wasserstein um he's a beekeeper and the owner of liquid gold apiary in Piermont. His interest in beekeeping began several years ago during his quest for a natural, sustainable means to enhance the growth and productivity of his property. He has multiple um, high producing hives and utilizes natural disease control methods to enhance the health of the colonies. His hives are made up of Italian, Carniolan, and Russian honeybee varieties, each renowned for specific traits, including gentleness, high productivity, and sturdiness. Nat is currently enrolled in the Cornell University beekeeping program. Um, when he's not beekeeping, he uh, is a crisis manager for financially troubled businesses. Um, and his company, uh, Lindenwood Associates, is in, um, located in Upper Nyack. And we are very lucky to have um, regularly at uh, Riverhook, the Hester Herring Case and Preserve, Nat Wasserstein. So thank you, Nat. Thank you, Bill. Hi, everyone. Hello. <laughs> Hi. What uh, I'll just start off by saying that what you may have noticed, or maybe you didn't notice, but towards the end of that, um, it looked like I was holding down my my jacket almost as if uh, I needed to use the restroom or something. But really, what was happening? was uh, a little baby bee had crawled up <laughs> underneath my jacket and I knew I was being filmed. So I was trying to be very cool about it. Um, uh, so the, the nurse bees um, are, the, the nurse bees pretty much don't fly until they, until they become foragers and they take their orientation flights and an orientation flight is, the bee leaves the hive and just sort of makes small circles, looking at the hive, going back to the hive. Doesn't really, doesn't really go very far. That's the first time they fly. Most of the time they're crawling. So when I when I move around uh, frames, sometimes these baby bees um, will fall onto the grass or onto me, and I won't know where they are um, unless, of course, um, they crawl into my pants. So um, that's, what, that's, what, that's what was happening. And fun, fun fact is um, uh, the very young bees, um, say the first three days after they emerge, um, they, they're noticeably fuzzy, almost like, almost like, almost like, a, like a young animal, uh, like a puppy. They have a they have hair um, in places that you wouldn't really, you wouldn't see um, on a regular bee, and that the hair go the fuzz goes away. So they have a baby fuzz. You can tell when they're when they're very young. They also they also um, behave as if they're not sure what to do. So if they're if they're not on the frame, cleaning out the cells or or tending to the queen they really don't know what to do. So if you drop them or if they're, they fall off of the frame, they just sort of sit there and, make, and slowly make their way back, hope, hoping that another bee comes and flies next to them and sort of coaches them back to the hive. So any questions? Well, I see that we have um, uh, Nyack Troop 2. It, it looks like they're in, um, is that, that looks like Grace Church, right? So you guys were there front and center, nice up close and personal with the bees and the hives. So uh, why don't you guys, uh, any any other questions or anything you wanna share about your experience at the apiary at Riverhook? We're just unmuting. You guys have any questions? Any experiences? What was the what was the most fun part of the, of the day? Was it hot or was it cold? It was very very hot. Sitting in the shade was really nice. <laughs> what did you learn about bees? I'll help you out a little bit. Um, so 
in the beginning, when I, when I was explaining the cluster, um, I made a point to say that the queen is in the middle. Well, that's not always true, but in, in the winter, she's absolutely in the middle. So they, they cluster and that's what keeps them warm. Um, she gets fed by the bees um, and they don't break cluster until it warms up. Um, un unfortunately, with um, with some of the, with some of the crazy weather changes, you could have a hot day. They could break cluster, um, go for a flight, and get caught outside when the temperatures drop. Um, so I've had a number of um, uh, losses when you know the weather just accident just it's just wacky lately um but uh that's what i was explaining to you when you when you guys were here so there's some questions in the chat nat so uh -huh. what from janet what's the difference between a honeybee and a bumblebee oh okay well um a bunch of things uh a bumblebee is a solitary bee. Um, it, uh, every bumblebee is a queen. Um, they don't live in social groups. Um, and they have, I think, between 12 and maybe 20 offspring in their life. Uh, they, they nest in burrows. Um, where they provision food in that burrow uh, for the next generation. And then they do it again and again and again. Um, bumblebees happen to be, uh, I, I don't know if they're actually on the endangered list, but some, uh, some bumblebees actually are. Um, we're, losing, we're losing them pretty rapidly. Um, for a variety of reasons, some because of pesticides, climate change. Um, so they do. They don't. Um, they don't make honey, but they do make something called bee bread. Uh, bee bread is a term. It really. It's really pollen. So when you look at um, a frame, a, a honeybee frame, and you see where the pollen is, it's it's really a mixture of pollen and a little bit of nectar. And it, it even ferments a little bit. So in a way, uh, it, it's close to being bread. So I guess that's how the name came about. So the bumblebees do have um, bee bread. Uh, they provision that for, uh, for their offspring. Um, a, a number of other differences. Um, and I'm not an entomologist, but uh, um, the bumble, you'll notice that a, when a bumblebee flies by, they're making a loud buzz. And when they land on a flower, their whole body is vibrating. That's not what happens with a honeybee. A honeybee lands on a, on a flower. Yeah, it buzzes a little bit when it flies around, but it's mostly gathering the pollen uh, by sort of walking on it um, or banging into it or shaking it a little bit. But the bumblebee is sort of like this little electric motor. They land on the, uh, on the flower and it just shakes up the flower um, in a way that um, actually makes bumblebees better pollinators than honeybees because of that as more pollen is transferred onto their bodies um, than honeybees. So there's a, those are a couple of differences. So um, a couple of questions um, on the same issue that you touched on uh, slightly before. Uh, Chris Pas pa uh, Patsos asks um, to, if you could speak more about the tremendous loss of bees that has been happening worldwide for years and what it means or should mean to all of us. And uh, on that same vein, Alison Crowther asked, is there any way to protect the bees from mite infestation? Okay. Well, there, 
there are 20,000 species of wild bees in the, in the world. In North America, there are approximately 4,000 species. Um, in New York alone, we have 420 species. And when you get down to it, honeybees are, there's, there's basically eight species of honeybees. It's, an, it's important to note that of the 420 sp species of bees in New York, 120 of them visit apple trees. So that just gives you an idea of how important bees are to the various crops that we have. Um, blueberries, raspberries, cranberries, they, they, would all, they, they would all not be pollinated without without bees. Um, uh, again, most of the, re there are a variety of reasons why we're losing bees. Honeybees in particular have been, um, have had a hard time uh, over the past 20 years with the varroa mite, um, the, it's actually called varroa destructor. And what this mite does, and a mite is pretty much like a tick, but it's big. So if, um, if you had a mite on you, in comparison to a honeybee, it would be like having a tick the size of an apple. Um, so pretty nasty. Um, they sort of suck the, the blood and the nutrients and the fat out of, um, out of the body of the bee. Um, and that starts in, in the capped brood. So the female mite makes her way right before the cell is capped. And then when she's in there with the, with the bee that has now become a, a, a pupa because the bee started make it, making a cocoon and is now changing into a bee from a larva into a bee. This female mite um, gives birth to a number of other mites, one male and a bunch of females. And they all feed on this young uh, bee. And so when the bee emerges, it's weak, it's often sick, and you can, you can lose a whole hive um, pretty quickly uh, with, uh, with an infestation of these mites. Now, how do you control it? Well, for, before I get into that, uh, back in, I think it was ninth, in the early 90s, we lost 70% of our honeybee hives to this Paris, this mite. Um, so it was a big deal. And it's really, it hasn't been, uh, it hasn't been effectively controlled other than through breeding. Um, and I'll get into that in a second, but um, there are some, there are some pesticides that um, that will kill the mite when the mite is on the adult body, but that's already after the mite has left the cell and done its damage there. So that's only partially effective. Um, there are chemicals made out of thyme. There are chemicals made out of, um, um, uh, what is it in mothballs? Uh, I can't remember what that chemical is. Um, all of Naphtha, I think. Yes. Naphtha? Yes. Yes. Um, but they all have uh, long term uh, bad effects um, on, on the bees. They weaken. Uh, they weaken the bees, uh, the chemicals stay in the wax. One of the, one of the methods that I'm using right now is to use the, the honeybees natural um, instincts to swarm. So when, I, 
when a bee swarm, when a beehive swarms, um, a queen, a new queen leaves a hive with anywhere between a third and a half of the hive with her. Um, usually this is a new queen. Sometimes it's the old queen because a new queen was just born. But when you, when you break that brood cycle, um, it, it, it sort of gives the hot, it gives the beehive a chance to, um, uh, to grow its brood without the infestation. So what I'm trying to do is break the brood cycle as much as I can. So when a hive is, is um, healthy enough to split, um, I, a split is sort of like an artificial swarm. You're, you're taking a population of, or you're taking a bunch of bees and you're putting it in a smaller hive so that you have two hives. So that has, that has decreased um, the ability for the mite to propagate. Um, I'm also experimenting right now with Russian bees. And, um, and the reason why I'm doing that is the Russian bees tend to, um, well, there's, there's a couple of reasons. One is the Varroa mite, for some reason, uh, tends to um, target drone cells more often than worker cells. But it's, but it's you can control the, the drone cells by removing them as one method, uh, as another method of reducing the disease. Um, but it's the worker cells that get infected that will ultimately lead to colony collapse. The Russian bees, however, for some reason, the Varroa mite almost exclusively attacks the drone cells and not the worker cells. I, I, there are some in the worker cells, but not at the, not at the numbers that you'll see with Italian or uh, Carniolan bees. Um, the second is the, the Russian bees have, I guess you call it hygienic behavior they can smell when a, when a cell is infected with the Varroa mite and they'll remove um, that, uh, that bee, that developing bee and discard it. Um, and so that's the second reason. And the third reason is um, they tend to swarm a lot and since they swarm a lot, um, they're constantly breaking this brood cycle and giving themselves a chance to propagate healthier bees. So those are some of the um, ways that you can approach it. So, so we have a question from uh, uh, Mayor Karen Terrapada, who is also uh, a founding board member of the Friends of Riverhook. She asked if the number if the bees were stressed by the number of visitors when the uh, scouts were there. I don't think so. Um, interestingly, though, I was I read in um, I think it was the Journal of Experimental Biology where there was a study uh, that um, that that showed that bees can recognize people. Um, so beekeepers think that their bees know them and I'm one of them. I, I, I believe that after a while they get to know you and they, their attitude sort of changes when, when you're tending them, they're not, once they realize who you are, they're okay. Um, but, but it was, it was shown that they can recognize faces. So if you do something wrong, they're going to remember you as well, um, but uh, I don't think they were stressed at all. If anything, um, that that first hive that we opened, they were a little bit defensive um, because I think they had um, gotten a little bit crowded very quickly, 
Um, uh, and you never know with bees. It's sometimes sometimes you could step on a bee and not know it, and that happens to me. I'll be tending a beehive, and um, and I'll get stung, and I'll wonder why, and then I'll realize it's because I put something down on a bee, um, or I stepped on a bee on the grass, um, or and here's here's one that I found out early is um, sometimes animals will wait and you know grab the bees as they come and go. Um, robins will do this a lot, chipmunks. So if if you just happen to be going to the hive after a robin had breakfast, they're going to be a little testy. Um, so. Uh, so you never know. So bees are animals, um, and uh, and you know they they behave like animals. Sometimes they're in a good mood. Sometimes they're not. So the good news is that the the scouts were not stressed by the number of bees. That's so right. um, so I have a question from uh, one of our neighbors who who asks: Since these amazing bees live right behind my backyard, I'm curious if they will come visit me. She says she's had a lot of visitors when her rhododendron was in bloom, but the deer have eaten all the flowering plants on her property. So will she have any, uh, without the flowering plants, will she have any visitors from, from the hives? Um, well, most likely they'll find something. Um, uh, the bees know when, when certain flowers are, are um, providing pollen or nectar. Sometimes flowers can differ by, by the time of day when they're expressing uh, nectar or pollen. They know for some reason. <laughs> they know when, uh, when to go out, when to come back in, when to go out for, for one thing and come back with something else. So um, I don't think I don't think not having the rhododendron is going to make it make a difference. A uh, fun fact, though, the rhododendron um, actually uh, in mass, when you have fields and fields of rhododendron, it actually creates uh, a type of honey. It, it, like a, I think it's um, Alexander the Great actually mentioned this because it. it it's crazy honey. It, for some reason, there's a um, toxin in rhododendron. Um, so when you have fields and fields of it, and there's this area, I think, in um, um, around, uh, around the Baltic where rhododendron grow and you're not supposed to, you're not supposed to eat the honey there. Um, now that doesn't mean that the honey is going to be poisonous because there's rhododendron. I mean, that it doesn't work that way. Um, but in that particular part of the world, where there were fields and fields and fields of wild rhododendron, um, there's just another fun fact, and I'm full of them. <laughs> so there, there is a question from someone. Um, uh, um, if how do you get in contact? With Riverhook to be involved in Riverhook projects, so that's an easy one. I can handle that. Nat, it's a uh, you would email friends of of Riverhook at gmail.com. That's uh, friends of Riverhook, one word at gmail.com, or you could visit our website, um, riverhook riverhook.org, or you can visit uh, us on Facebook and uh, Instagram at, at friends of Riverhook. So um, I'm gonna take. Uh, let me see. I, I think I have. Um, uh, we we will try to go uh, just only a couple minutes over to be um, courteous of everyone's time, but we just have a lot of questions in here. Um, I have another uh, question from uh, Chris Pat Patsos. How does the smoke help when you seem to use it only every few minutes and it seems to dissipate so quickly? That's a pretty good question. Um, so. There's an alarm pheromone that uh, bees will give off when they're when they feel defensive. Um, the smoke 
makes it difficult for that alarm pheromone to get around. Um, so what I do is I provide a little bit of smoke where the guards are, which is at the front. And I, I usually give a bunch of puffs around uh, the perimeter of the hive because the, that's where they're going to be. That's where they're going to be guarding when they're not in the front. And um, and before I open a hive, I I open it slightly and I give it a couple of puffs and I close it just to calm everybody down. Um, another fun fact, okay? Um, it turns out that the alarm pheromone has uh, certain esters. These are certain chemicals that that have smells and the, the, the smell of the alarm pheromone or the esters that are in uh, that protein um, smell like banana. So um, two things, if you're ever near a beehive, tending a beehive and you get a whiff of banana, stop what you're doing because there's an alarm pheromone going off and they're about to, you know, and once that starts, it's really hard to stop. Um, and second, don't eat a banana before you go beekeeping <laughs> and don't bring one near the hive because they'll get confused. Um, so another fun fact. Oh. Um, someone asked that somebody says they haven't seen the chimney on the hive before and does it become the main entrance or exit? These are all great questions, by the way. It does, it does. So this was a design that um, um, I found actually on, um, on Kickstarter, a, a group of um, entrepreneurs in Italy right before COVID had come up with um, this design. Um, what they wanted to do is make a, make a hive that could be installed near a home so that it would be a safe place, a, a safe thing to approach. Um, and they needed some funding for the first five or 10 hives. So, what, you know, I was very enthusiastic about helping them out. Um, and then COVID hit, so they couldn't get the hives out of the country. Um, long story short, we, I, I got some of it out and I had to make some adaptations to it. And, um, and the theory is that the, the bees will come and go through the top entrance and they, there's no way to go in and out of the observation hive at the ground level. So you can look at it, you can, um, I mean, I, I provide smoke rounds in any way because I think the bees at some point will figure it out. Um, and I'm not going to take the risk, but um, but it seems to work. And I they they seem to go about their business whenever I'm uh, tending that observation hive. I I'm not having any problem. Knock on wood. Um, they don't they don't seem to be bothered. Um, and I think it's because they haven't made a connection between the top of the hive when I take it off and I start. Uh, tending the bees and the actual entrance, which is on the top. Um, so they don't know what to defend because that's the way in and out. So I, I think that there are just um, two more questions, um, but I'm gonna take prerogative of, of the moderator and ask um, uh, one other, um, but, but I'll get to those two first and just be mindful. We wanna just give folks, um, you know, uh, maybe five, do, do less, just five more minutes. Um, how long do you leave the sugar water in the new hive is one question. Um, the other question, I'll give them all to you now and then you can answer them. Uh, the other question um, is how is the honey made? And I'm sure that that could be a longer explanation, but if you could just give some of the basics of how the honey is made. And then one thing I want you to touch on before we ended the evening was, uh, could you talk about the native beehive that we got from Bee Conservancy? that um, was at the end, it was the object that, that kind of was given this kind of dramatic focus of the camera as it flew away, that oct octagonal um, uh, object on the pole. Okay. 
In whatever order you'd like. <laughs> okay, so I'll start off with the sugar water. So since these are new hives um, and they're growing their population, um, I feed them one-to-one -one sugar water, sugar to water, uh, because that's the closest I can get to natural nectar. Um, if, if the bees were more established and they made it through the winter, I would be feeding them probably a two or a three to one version um, as they come out of winter because they need to, they, they really need to be fed in order to start, um, start creating brood. Um, I replace it every, right now, since these are all new hives, I'm, I'm replacing it just about every week. Um, some of them are finishing it in two days. Um, and it's a good thing because when they're finishing it and I end up looking in the hive, it, all sorts of stuff is going on. So it's always a good sign. Um, how honey is made is a, is a, is a big co complicated question, but um, I'll just say that uh, there's, a, there's a process, a transformation from nectar to honey where nectar, the honey is less than 20% water. And um, it's got a bunch of enzymes in it. Uh, nectar is carried in a honey stomach, similar to like a, a cow having a separate stomach. Um, so this honey stomach is what the bees use to collect the nectar from the field. When they get into the hive, what they do is they, um, they, they blow bubbles. Um, it takes, I, I think, at ten minutes at a time, so that the, um, so that the nectar is exposed to the air, um, and all of the bacteria, so that it can start to ferment and the, and it can evaporate and get more and more concentrated. Um, so the so the combination of all of that occurring, a um, uh, couple of other complicated things, turns it to honey, um, and and of course honey is it, honey could be very different by hive, by type of bee, by time of season, uh, type of flower, a um, whole bunch of things. Um, and the, uh, the third question about the, uh, the wild bees. Um, so that, that hive um, in theory is supposed to attract um, two, kind, two or three kinds of stingless bees, um, leaf cutter bees, uh, blue orchard bees, and, um, hmm. I forgot the other one. Um, so the, they're tiny harmless bees, but they're excellent pollinators. So similar to uh, my, my little story about the bumblebee, um, these wild bees do the same thing. They, in their little bodies, they're moving around a whole lot. So when they, when they jump onto a flower, they're shaking up a whole storm. And um, I think, I read that bumblebees and some wild bee species um, can be up to 40 times more efficient as pollinators than honeybees. Um, so at, at some point, we're gonna figure out how to use these bees for our crops. There's some research being done in almond groves in California uh, with blue orchard bees, but you know, it's pretty difficult. Um, we've been, as a, human beings have been tending bees for more than, for, for more than 10,000 years. Um, that's a long time. And they haven't, there's, there's not a lot of evidence, there's some um, of tending these stingless bees um, or these wild bees. So, sure. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Nat. And thanks to the Bee Conservancy for 
giving us that hive. So now I'd like to turn it over to um, to Allison Crowther. You know, I'd like to thank so many people for making this program possible. The Nyack Library for hosting our event, uh, Tracy Dunstan, who's head of adult services. Of course, Nat Wasserstein for his passion with the bees and um, choosing to set up this wonderful educational uh, exhibit at, at Riverhook. Really, thank you so much, Nat. Um, Mayor, Mayor Karen Terrapata for her support through the village as well as being a board member, uh, Friends of Riverhook. Uh, we are, our, our purpose in life with Riverhook is to uh, spread the word, to help raise funds, to keep our programs growing and developing um, up the Upper Nyack DPW, Department of uh, Public Works, who they do, this team does an amazing job with major uh, work uh, in improving the properties and cleaning it up. Um, Bill Batson, of course, who's done tremendous work through marketing and pulling together some of these programs for us and the Bee Conservancy for that hive, which I actually have studied. I walked up to it. I wasn't stung by a single bee. And I actually witnessed a little tiny one go into its special size hole. <laughs> I think mason bees were the other ones, perhaps. Mason you bees, that's it. Yep. Yes, yeah, see, I learned. And we can all learn by going and, and looking and reading these wonderful signs. Um, I want to thank Vinnie Garrison, who actually was a, uh, a, a lacrosse player and a friend of our son, Wells Crowther, uh, and when they were teenagers at Nyack High School. He has this wonderful, uh, not only a teacher at Nanuet uh, High School, but he has uh, Flying Films New York who's done this wonderful job filming what will be four or more of our educational programs uh, that the Wells Hermy Crowther Charitable Trust is extremely pleased and, and proud to be part of bringing this wonderful educational work, uh, making it available to the public through the Nyack Library and, and archival as well. I also want to especially thank the scouts of Nyack Troop 2, who have just been such a great help, not only with the apiary, but, and you will see this in our next program, the worm bin composting project. So we'll get onto that in our next one. Jack Gannon, who is the senior patrol leader, Milo Delia, patrol leader, Christopher Pierce, assistant patrol leader, and Carson Graham and Matthew Chen. Uh, scout leaders, Ian Graham, who is the scoutmaster, Seth Delia, who is assistant scoutmaster, and Kier Levesque, uh, who is the scoutmaster emeritus. So thank you all so much for making these beautiful programs possible and have a wonderful evening and go dream about bees. <laughs> and just some, a few, few more closing remarks from the president of uh, Friends of Riverhook, uh, Paul J. Curley. Oh, thank, thank you, Bill. So um, Allison, Thank you so much for uh, covering all, all the people who deserve uh, uh, appreciation. I guess there's one more, and that is yourself. Um, so th thank you, Allison, for helping to make these, uh, these, these programs possible. Um, so I encourage everyone uh, here to come visit the preserve um, as often as, as you can or as you like. It's really beautiful, um, especially as the weather's getting nice. Um, and also to it, visit the, the website, which is riverhook.org. Um, and I hope you would consider, uh, if possible, supporting our work by making a contribution on the donation page there at uh, riverhook.org. So um, thank you so much, uh, everyone, for attending and for those who participated. Uh, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks everyone. See you in October Thank with the, uh, the the Worm Bin Project sponsored by patoslaw.com. Thanks everybody. Thanks everyone. Thanks for coming.